Thank you. Thank you. Isaiah, not not just from Psalm Lady. Oh. Not from church. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 59. You know, Josh was gone Sunday. You guys knew that, right? Yeah. Uh, you thought it was his stunt double. You thought maybe his it was his stunt double that did the singing on uh, Sunday. So that was actually Charlie who's Taj's stunt double. <laughs> Not uh, actually Taj. Sometimes I can't tell the difference. Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah 59. I dress better. <laughs> I can't tell. <laughs> While you're turning to Isaiah 59, I'll read one of the theme verses that we've looked at as we've gone through Isaiah, and that's in chapter 5, verse 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression, for righteousness, and behold, a cry. And in the Hebrew language, those words are almost identical, and except for the uh, literally the consonantal ending of each of those. And though the sound is so similar, the meanings are the opposite. Judgment is the opposite of oppression, and righteousness is the opposite of a cry. Sometimes we are dishonest in asking, God, what is it that you want? Sometimes when it seems that God is sifting us or He is chastising us, I think we're less than honest and we would say, God, what do you want from us? And yet God has said what He wants. So here we are in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 9. And we see, therefore is judgment far from us. Neither doth justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity. For brightness, but we walk in darkness. We grope for the law like the blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. We roar all like bears, and mourn sore like doves. We look for judgment, but there is none for salvation, but it is far off from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before Thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressing and lying against the Lord, and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood, and judgment is turned away backward, and just to stand the far off, for truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot win, enter. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. I'd like to read that last verse, verse 15, all together, if you will, please. Beginning in, at the yea. Yea, truth faileth. Let's try it again. We'll all read that together. Verse 15, Isaiah 59. Yea, Truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. Now read this together, shall we? And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. Let's read that last phrase again. And it displeased him that there was no judgment. You ready? And it displeased him that there was no judgment. Let's, let's say it again. Now look up if you can remember what it is. Ready? And it displeased him that there was no judgment. You know, the message this evening is very, very simple, and it's simply laid out, and it's, it's stated over and over and over again throughout Isaiah, but it's stated specifically in this text over and over and over again. And the message this evening is that it displeases God when there, that there is no judgment. It displeased Him that there is no judgment. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for help understanding the Scripture tonight. God, I do pray that You'll help us to understand Your Word tonight. Lord, help us not to hold back anything that ought to be said. Help us not to say more than Your Word says. And above all, when it's all said and done, I pray that we be so impressed with Your character, with Your Word, and so uh, aware of what it is that You want, that God would actually care and do it. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Behold, in verse 1 of chapter 59, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither His ear heavy that it cannot hear. The idea of short-handed is has to do with reach. You know, one of the best illustrations for that is when the word short is used in Romans 3.23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In other words, when it comes to our being good enough to come to God, 
for us being good enough to not be separated from God. We've come short. And the reason we're short is that perfection is God's standard and we have fallen short of that. Isn't it nice, isn't it polite of the Scripture not to say how far short we've fallen? You ever think about that? You know, I mean, when I think about falling short, you know, I think about shooting an arrow at, at, a, at a distant target and having it not quite make it. But the reality of it is, is that when in comparison with God's personal holiness and in comparison with the truth that we've fallen short of that, I mean, it's like we never, you know, it's like trying to jump 10 feet when you're five foot and never getting off the ground at all. We don't make it halfway. We don't make it quarter way. The Bible says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. And so the very things that would get us to God are actually counted against us because they're done in lieu of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so basically, to say that we've fallen short is so grand an understatement that you could actually say that we haven't made us move in the right direction at all. Or rather, instead, you could say we have gone the wrong direction. You ever try to shoot a slingshot and not know how? Anybody ever see, uh, you ever try to watch somebody shoot a slingshot for the first time? It's one of those things. I hope everyone here shot slingshots when you're children. Angela, your children have slingshots, don't they? I know Josiah has one. He shot me in the leg with it. But they really need them. And they need lots of good rocks and ball bearings. And so, I mean, just kids, I mean, windows do get broken. Those things do happen. But it is part of a healthy, wholesome childhood experience for children to have a slingshot. But what is not healthy is to be around when someone is learning to use a slingshot. I've seen, I've seen the ball. I don't know how it can happen, but you pull it back. You put a stone in. Name it Stacy here. Okay. Put a stone in. I'm going to get Josiah. He's the one that got me. There you go, duck boy. All right. So they pull the thing back. And I'm telling you, when they let go, I don't know what happens, but somehow that rock or that ball bearing can just absolutely go backward. Have you ever fished with somebody for the first time? I'm going to take, it's the, oh, it's the 22nd. We missed it, didn't we? We were going fishing. You left town on the 22nd. That was, that was yesterday. We were going fishing. with The, the uh, winners of VBS last year, uh, Emily and Luke, won a fishing trip with me. And I'm not really afraid to take them fishing because I've taken a lot of people fishing for the first time. Matter of fact, I took Mindy fishing this last week, and we caught 19 bass what we caught with Mindy when we went fishing, big bass. And, uh, but when you take somebody fishing and they learn to cast the first time, something about the release on that hook, ask me afterward, I'll show you a neat picture of Michael Miller with a hook way deep in his lip. Uh, but something about that hook, you know, I mean, it isn't that, I mean, it's supposed to go this way, but it doesn't even go that way, it goes the opposite. And that's kind of the way we are, being silly is, is uh, one thing, but the fact of the matter is that when it comes to our falling short to the glory of God, my friend, we've gone the absolute total opposite direction period but by the grace of God through the blood of Jesus Christ we who were once afar off are now made nigh or near to God because of the blood of Jesus we have boldness of access we have zero excuse ever to be out of fellowship with God because we can simply confess our sins and he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness now, that's the state in which we stand today, but my friend, in the Old Testament of the Scripture, God had a way, had a plan, where sacrifices could be offered, and sin could be atoned for on the basis of the future work of the cross. And if you study Hebrews, you'll see that though it was much more difficult for a person to have access to God and to offer sacrifices, and certainly, it certainly wasn't more costly, because God's, the price that God paid, and that Christ paid for our sin, my friend, was not less costly than the blood of bulls and goats and and of doves and, and of the offerings that we could offer as an atonement. So, Israel had no excuse ever for being out of fellowship with God. And so, verse 1 is a major, uh, major understatement when it says God's hand is not shortened. God's hand is not shortened. You know, a guy who boxes has a big advantage if he has a good wingspan, a long, long length. If you watch good boxers, you'll, you'll always notice that the tall guy has an advantage. Now, if the little guy can get inside and tie him up and just play a dirty match, you know, he can have a chance of getting in some short punches and so forth. But I'm telling you, the sluggers are the guys with the long arms. They got long arms. I, uh, there was, I can't remember the name of the guy, but he was actually getting ready to fight uh, Roy Jones Jr., and he actually lived in Delray, and I met him. He was my height, same height that I was. And uh, he was telling me, hey, I'm training to fight uh, Roy Jones Jr. 
Is that, that the name of the boxer? Charlie, I always mess up people's names. Is that the guy that he was the champion back before uh, Pacquiao, Pacquiao or whatever? Yeah, he was going to close back too. Yeah, so anyway, um, he was from Pensacola, but he told me he was going to fight him. And, and he was talking about boxing, and we were the same height, and he said, hold out your arm. And so I did, and I held out my arm like this, and with a, my, my finger stretched, and he held his hand out, his arm out. He was the same height I was, but his arm was like this much longer than mine. Same height as me. He thought, man, no wonder. Boy, I hate to box that guy because he could stand out here and just throw those punches and it's, you know, he can reach further than I can. And so the idea here with God is that God's hand is not shortened. When it comes to reaching out and grasping and holding and saving, God is not at all diminished in His ability to save. The Bible says, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. And the emphasis here is that it isn't as though God, you know, doesn't save because He doesn't know or isn't aware of the problem. Um, it's really a sad statement to say neither is His ear heavy that it cannot hear because what it implies is that God's able to save and He's listening for a cry, but there's no cry. That's the idea. In other words, if we would just call out to God and say, God, help us, God's listening. So God is able and God is listening, but then we see that there's a lack of judgment. And again, we see the same problem that Israel had, they continue to have. Verse 2, the Bible says, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid His face from you that He will not hear. Now, is God listening? Is God listening? Yes. Okay. Here's what we think a lot of times. We look at when, as David has said, uh, that uh, my iniquities or your iniquities have separated you from God. Actually, this is passage here as well, I think. Um, but uh, we look at a state, the statements about iniquity and separating us from God, and we think that iniquity is what keeps God from hearing us. But when you look at the language in the Scripture, the Bible says your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid His face from you that He will not hear. Now what we actually see is that God is listening and God is able to reach, but our sins have made it so that God doesn't hear from us. And why is it that God doesn't hear from us? Because the Bible says His face is hid from us. It does not say that we are hidden from Him. It says His face is hidden from us. What does that imply? It implies that our sins are keeping us from seeing God's face and crying out to Him. It has always been true that we ourselves and the Satan tell a lie and that is that God won't save me or God won't forgive me because of my sin. But actually the reality of it is is that God sees me, God sees my sin, but I don't see God because of my sin. You know, the truth of the matter is most of the time we don't feel like getting back into fellowship with God. And the reason is we don't even see Him so that we could even desire Him. Friend, you ought to be afraid of sin. You'll be terrified to death of sin, and the reason you'll be afraid of it is because of its ability to blind you from seeing God, to deafen you, and to literally mute your tongue from calling out to God. That's why the, the, the Scripture uses so many analogies of sin as a trap and iniquity as a snare. What does a snare do? Well, snare takes away the capability of that which is ensnared in it from motion or moving. If you watch a real good snare, what does it do? It ties up an animal's legs, makes it so that the harder he pulls, the more he's ensnared, the more he tries to get out, the more that he's caught up in the trap. And that's what sin does. Now, the warning here is implicit, it's simple. The warning is, first of all, you ought to be afraid to get involved with sin because of its danger. It's amazing how the little sins 
don't seem, we, it's, it's as though we have a scale for that, you know, little and big. But it seems as though the things that don't have immediate consequence or cannot be definitively called sin are the ones that ensnare us the most quickly. It's amazing, you know, you can let something come through the eye gate. You can let something come in, you can hear something that will affect your mind. And it's really amazing how that, you know, it's, it's almost like we want to let something in. We want to see a little bit. Just nothing really bad. We don't want to hear anything really bad. We don't want to see anything really bad. But we want just a little bit. We're not going to gossip. We're just going to let some things be known. We're not really going to, and you could, you could talk about it, but sin has that ability of just a little bit. And when that little bit happens, all of a sudden sin tells you, here I am. Before you, before you commit it, it tells you, I'm not sin, I'm not bad. But once you've done it, it says, oh yeah, I'm in. And it blinds you. And it deafens you. My friend, God is not blind. God is not deaf. And God's arm is not short. Verse 3, for your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue hath muttered perverseness. And then verse 4. What is it that God wants? Remember? He looked for judgment, but behold, oppression for righteousness, and behold, a cry. Verse 4. None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. How many times is it that we get ourselves in a predicament and we're not even willing to admit that we got in the predicament because of sin? We want to make ourselves the victim of circumstances and we talk about, well, this, this is the predicament. We'll outline it. And oftentimes it's like we should have never been there. Should have never done that. Should not have committed that. The reality of it is, is that the Bible says that it's very, very clear, it's very plain what has caused the hands to be defiled with blood and the fingers with iniquity. Verse 5, They hatch cockatrice eggs and weave the spider's web. He that eateth other eggs dieth, and that which is crust breaketh out into a viper. Their webs shall not become garments, neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are as works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hand. By the way, who's this speaking of? It's speaking of the Jews. God's people. Just as Proverbs says, their feet run to evil and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they know not. And there is no, what's that next word? Judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace. I don't want to make too much of this, but I don't want to make too little of it either. Isn't it a tragedy that the people who are called by the name, that literally they're the ones that God said, you're going to be the ones that I'm going to use nationally for my kingdom. I'm going to rule and reign over you, Israel, God's people. Isn't it a shame that actually Israelis are known for being crooked? You ever think about that? The fact of the matter is, is that Jews, in any time and any generation, are known for being deceitful, lying crooks. It's true. It's a fact. I've been taken by Jews I don't know how many times. I remember we're going and looking in the evening. We wanted to look at a pickup for uh, Devin Frost. It's the one that Danny Marino drives today. It had 50,000 miles on it. It was offered by a guy that's a car dealer. And we went to look at it at nighttime, and he wouldn't let us test drive it or look it over too close, wouldn't let us look at it in the daytime, wouldn't schedule it for us. We should have known better, but we didn't know who we were dealing with. And uh, got, a, got the truck for a pretty good deal, went to drive it home, found out the frame was completely rusted in half. There's no way in the world you could check it out at nighttime and he wouldn't let us drive it. I'm telling you, the frame was so rusted that the truck started turning, like doing U-turns, because the frame was broken on it. And the man knew it, called me, hey, did you know the frame was rusted out? Mm -hmm. Oh, it wasn't rusted. I mean, it, was, it turned out it was a pool truck. And had, I mean, the frame had gotten chlorine on it, was completely rusted out. Danny still drives it today. You notice the truck's about six inches shorter than it should be because I welded a different frame underneath it. We got ripped off. Uh, went to buy 
two by fours mm -hmm. for our church. And I called the guy. He said these are not regular two by fours. These are better than the regular two by fours. These aren't just the cheap wood that you get in the store, you know, at Home Depot. And I thought, well, I wonder kind of wood they are. And you know, old houses did have better, stronger uh, wood. And so I thought, well, I don't know what they are. So I went to look at them. And I didn't know it, but they were two inches short of eight foot. He sold them all to me as brand new two by fours, and <laughs> they'd been cut two inches shorter than eight foot. Got ripped off. I hate to say it, but that's characteristic. It's characteristic of the very people who ought to be most holy, most righteous, most fair, most just, and who ought to trust God the most. Sometimes it can be true of Christians, too. You know, my dad used to have a policy on his used car lot that he tried not to sell cars to Christians. I'm serious. A number of occasions, he would just get burned so badly. It would just cost him so much to sell cars to Christians because he got taken advantage of by Christians so many times. Or one time when I was little, a person in our church asked my dad to help him find a car. My dad had a car dealer's license, so he took him to the car lot. Or not to the car lot, took him to the car auction. And uh, warn the guy, don't look, don't buy that car. That one's been through here a few times, and it's a problem. There's, it's, it's got issues. But it looked nice, and the guy bought the car. And he bid on it. So my dad had to pay for it. He go to drive it home, and uh, the guy's driving home, and on the way home, and dad was giving it to him at cost, what it cost him. On the way home, the engine went. So the guy's wife said, you're not buying that piece of junk. It's got a bad engine. How about we try to sell you something like that? And so my dad had to put an engine in the car for him to make it right because they were slandering him. And then they never paid him for the car. Another time, well, I could just go on and on and on. Until finally we said, you know, don't buy, don't sell cars to Christians. They felt as though they had the right to take advantage because they were, you know, you're a Christian. You're supposed to give me, you know, you're supposed to do this for me. And it's okay for me not to take care of you <laughs> because you're Christian. It's too bad, isn't it? Sometimes. The Bible says here, it indicates that the very people that ought to be all about judgment and justice because why should any person be about judgment and justice and righteousness? What would make any person have a great esteem for judgment, for justice, and for righteousness? Why would any person love judgment, love justice, love righteousness? Why? Because they love God, and that's what He's all about. And it's pretty easy to tell a person who doesn't love God. It's pretty easy to tell you don't love God when you don't love righteousness. You're okay with things not being right, righteous. You're okay with injustice, particularly if it happens to suit you or go your way. There are a lot of people who actually like the idea of seeing who can take the greatest advantage in a deal. Instead of saying, hey, you know what, I want anybody that does, does anything, has any kind of business with me to go away saying, man, I'm glad I did business with that person. Instead they think, well, you know what, you try to get me, I'll try to get you, we'll see who wins. I feel like I could be more crooked than you can. And a lot of times we, we, we uh, enjoy treachery and trickery. And uh, anybody here ever watched Princess Bride? I've watched Princess Bride. I've watched scenes from Princess Br Princess Princess Bride. Uh, I watched scenes from it. The scene where the little small guy is sitting on a rock, and they're I think they're they're going to drink chalices of poison or whatever, and he gets the guy to turn around, and uh, the guy turns around, he switches the chalices, and then they both drink them, and then the guy starts laughing because. Ha, 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 I switched the chalices, and he said, I poisoned my own. Actually, poisoned both glasses, I think. We think that's really clever, don't we? Why do we think it's clever? Clever. Because of the trickery of it. You know? I built up my immune system so that I could poison myself and poison you, but it wouldn't hurt me as much. And we just think that things like that are clever. That's the way we think. Why? Because justice and judgment, righteousness and rightness, and I understand it's just a movie. But those things we admire oftentimes. What we ought to admire is forthrightness, honesty, character. We need to teach. We need to teach character. We need to preach character. 
doing right at your own hurt, doing right at your own expense. So long as I'm righteous, it does not matter what the cost is to me personally. We need to teach that. God reflects that. My friend, has righteousness ever been at a small cost for God? No, my friend, it cost Him the blood of His Son. And so we ought to revel in the desire to have righteousness even if it costs us. It's a godly principle, something God wants. Look, let's look at our conclusion. Here's why, verse 8, The way of peace they know not, and there is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace. Everything they do is crooked. It's wrong. Therefore is judgment far from us, neither doth justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity. For brightness, but we walk in darkness. Why does nothing ever work? Why does nothing ever make sense? Well, because of the paths that we make. Because of the darkness that's in our lives. You reap what you sow. We grope for the wall like the blind. We grope as if we had no eyes. You see the picture here? It's like a blind person trying to get a hold of something solid or stable. You ever think, you ever walk in the dark and it's so dark out that you can't see anything? And you know, you're, uh, I've learned, I'm, I'm getting to be pretty experienced at walking in the dark. Matter of fact, it's been a long time since I've kicked anything or slammed anything, hasn't it, baby? Probably years, hasn't it? I've become accustomed to searching for furniture as I walk in the darkness, and sometimes in the daylight as well. You know, you go to sit down, your chair's not there any longer. Or, uh, you know, you go to walk in the hallway and there's a couch where the hallway should be, that sort of thing. I've gotten to where I'm kind of, you know, circumspect. But you're in the darkness and you're groping for something, you're looking. And I miss it sometimes. I, 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 laugh, I laugh sometimes at how badly I guess where a wall is or a door is and how badly I miss it. I, I, a couple of weeks ago, I can't remember where I was, but I was somewhere, probably in our house, and I literally went in the wrong door. Yes, it was our house. We have a bedroom and we have a bathroom, and you know, there's a door here and a door here. And I was going in our bedroom, but I went in our bathroom. It was dark. And by the way, I'm minus 6'5 in both eyes. If I take my contacts out, I can't see anything. And so I'm going in our, our uh, bathroom. I'm going in our bedroom, and there's a wall in our bedroom, but I can't feel the wall. It's not there because it's like our vanity in our cabin. And so I turned, thinking, well, where am I at? And I turned, and I go walking, and I walked right into the wall in the bathroom. Boom. Not very hard because I learned to walk a lot more carefully than I used to walk. But I know what it is when it says that you grope for a wall like a blind man. If I can just get a wall, you know, then I can feel my way along and identify things and I know where I'm, I'm practicing for when I'm totally blind. That way I can get around, you know. But you, if you can get a hold of somebody, but a person who's blind, who's groping in the darkness, boy, they can just barely miss anything. And if, if they keep turning and groping and they miss everything, you know, you just you don't even know where you're at. Groping in the darkness. Well, that's true of God's people that are called by His name today, but that are not believers in Jesus. Jews that say they are Jews and are not. Isn't it true? There are no more charitable giving people when it comes to trying to do good deeds than the Jews. Trying to do things to justify themselves, and they're saying, God, we're good. Why? Why? Well, we know why, because you've ignored your sin that separated you from God. You can do all the good things you want to, and your righteousness is as filthy rags. Groping in darkness, no wall. The Bible says they have made them crooked paths. It says in verse 9, Therefore is judgment far from us, neither doth justice overtake us. We wait for light, but I hope behold obscurity for brightness, but we walk in darkness. Isaiah said, We grope for the wall like the blind. We grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday. As in the night we are in desolate places as dead men. We roar all like bears and mourn sore like doves. We look for judgment, but there is none for salvation, but is far off from us. Did you read verse 11 carefully? We look for judgment, but there is none for salvation, but it is far off from us. What does God want to do? Does God want to save? Yes. Does God want judgment? Yes. The problem is, is that when they say we look for judgment, they're not looking for God's judgment. They're looking to do the wrong thing and have God judge it right. 
You see that clarified as we go further. For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. Transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. So this whole time, God, we need judgment. We need you to judge. We have known sin in our lives. Christian, God knows you. He knows all the way right into your heart. What's your, what is your sin that you know about and that God knows about that you won't deal with? What is it? If you're not being honest, if you say, God, why is everything wrong? Why is there no judgment? When you have sin, you know about it. God knows about it. The Bible says they know their iniquities. They know what they've done wrong. Isn't it amazing the audacity that the Pharisees had when they would come and tempt Jesus? Calling for judgment. Who should we pay tribute to? Caesar or God? Hey, what does the Bible say? What does the law say about adultery? This woman was taken in adultery in the very act. We want justice. We want judgment. And Jesus said, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. In other words, you are covered in your own iniquity and you know it. And while you're crying, while you're calling out for salvation, while you're crying for judgment, you're clinging to your wickedness. Friends, you can't have it both ways. Then or now. You can't have God intervene. You can't have God save in your life. I'm not talking about being saved from your sins. I'm talking about being saved, delivered from the, the circumstances, even in the sin that you are ensnared in as a believer. You can't have God save when you have knowing iniquity. In verse 13, and transgressing and lying against the Lord, departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. Where did the words of falsehood come from? The heart. Right from the heart. Well, we could talk about that a lot, couldn't we? The heart. We talk about Daniel and those men that were taken captive into Babylon. You remember what happened in their hearts? Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. What does the New Testament say about the heart? It says, Not that which goeth in the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out because it comes from the heart. It's the heart of man. And they know it's in the heart. And so we see in verse 14, Judgment is turned away backward, and judgment is standeth afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth. Boy, I mean, my, my eyes, as I look on, on the Scripture, my eyes automatically just pull out that phrase, truth faileth. Can truth fail? Can truth fail? Is, it's, let's put it this way. Is true ever not true? Is something that's true, is truth absolute? Can something that's true ever not be true? Truth is always truth, isn't it? So truth is not the failure. The idea is truth fails of you. In other words, there's no truth in you. It's not that truth is wrong. Truth fail. I look at that phrase. I'm like, wow, truth fail? What is that? No. Truth faileth of you. There's no truth in you. He that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey, and the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. Okay. This evening we're going to end there. I'm going to ask the question again. What was God's problem? What was God's indictment with Judah and with Israel? What was God's problem? What was God's indictment with Judah and with Israel? What did God have against Israel? There's no righteousness. There's no righteousness and there's no judgment. And yet here we are at the latter stage of Isaiah's ministry. Having ministered under three kings... The message is the same, and the problem is the same. And people are saying, what is wrong? Isn't that amazing? The message has always been the same. The problem has always been the same. And friend, it isn't honest to say, I don't know where I went wrong. Went wrong by going into sin. Went wrong by your iniquity.
covering your face so that you can't see God. Father, help us to be honest when judgment fails, when truth fails to diagnose where we've gone wrong. Help us be honest about our sin. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, just a minute, we'll take some, some prayer requests this evening. I do want to give an update.